So the concept of the gutter and closure is one of the most important concepts in McLeod's understanding comics. If cartooning is the fundamental way that comics tend to represent the world around them, well, the gutter is the fundamental way comics create meaning and show the passage of time. Now, the gutter refers to the place between panels. So one panel border, a blank space, and another panel border. It doesn't necessarily have to be a specific panel border, but it refers to that place that lets us know that we've moved from one panel to another. Sometimes it's white space, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's just a line. The gutter is necessary to what McLeod says is the magic of comics, closure. He defines it as observing the parts but perceiving the whole. It's a term that originally comes from gestalt psychology, in which it's used to describe the process whereby incomplete forms, situations, etc. are completed subjectively by the viewer, or they seem to complete themselves. So it's a term that's very apt for that work that we do, McLeod says, between the axe swing and the scream. McLeod's explanation is pretty clear. So this lecture is going to focus a little bit more on giving you some real-world examples. So the first kind of transition McLeod talks about is the moment-to-moment -moment transition. In these transitions, we require very little closure. We generally know what's happening because, well, it's less than half a second between each panel. It doesn't require a lot of thought. It usually features the same subject and notes a very, very small passage of time, literally from one moment to the next. Action to action, on the other hand, still requires little closure, and still usually features the same subject. It's just a difference in the amount of time that passes. Whereas in the previous panel, we see Spider-Man lowering his head and lifting his palm very slowly, here we get movements between a kick and a punch. You get the beginning of a jump and the landing. So the difference between action to action and moment to moment is really a difference of time. Subject to subject transitions, well, these require a lot of closure. It might seem really obvious to us because we usually understand from the context that, for example, in the Why the Last Man strip, that's not a completely different blonde woman. It's probably the blonde woman from the back of the first panel. And just because we've switched to different people who aren't in the panel before that, we understand they're probably still in the same place. If you were to take just those panels on their own, there's nothing in those pictures that inherently tells us they must be in the same place. We know it from context. Subject to subject transitions feature the same idea or scene, but different subjects, hence the title, switching between people or objects. There's a variable passage of time in subject to subject transitions, but it's usually very short. We're usually not talking about massive amounts of time between these panels because they usually are in the same scene or in the same place. That's not the case for scene-to-scene -scene transitions. Scene-to-scene -scene transitions require advanced closure, what McLeod calls deductive reasoning. We have to understand that we're meant to know that the house in that first panel and the woman in the second panel, well, she's inside the house. We don't see her inside the house, say, in the window, but we understand because of the way that narrative works. If we see a house and then someone inside of a house, that person is probably inside the same house we just saw. This, as the title indicates, describes transitions from one scene to another. A classic version might be, meanwhile, back at the ranch. In this case, by Jaime Hernandez from Love and Rockets, we're switching back and forth between past and present which means that scene-to-scene -scene transitions can be highly variable in terms of the passage of time and or space. A scene-to-scene -scene transition is the sort of transition that lets us know, well, something is happening on the other end of the world at the same time, or that we've jumped into the future or back into the past. That's one of the reasons it requires this kind of deductive reasoning on our part, advanced closure. It may or may not feature the same subjects. That depends on what kind of story it's telling. Next, we move to a sort of tricky to describe transition, the aspect to aspect transition. Now this transition requires closure, not just to make sense of what's happening, but to distinguish it from say, scene to scene or subject to subject transitions. For example, in the Tezuka strip on the bottom, are those three or four different people or are they the same person? Well, we understand that they're meant to be the same person. Aspect to aspect transitions show different aspects of the same scene. So unlike a scene-to-scene -scene transition where we go to a different scene, 
or subject-to-subject transition, which is usually used to go between subjects and often used for dialogue. The aspect-to-aspect transition is about creating a sense of time, a sense of space, and a sense of the environment. We understand that all of these things are happening around the same time, but it's giving us a broader view of the action or the scene. There's little to no passage of time in aspect-to-aspect transitions. That's one of the things that separates it from scene to scene or subject to subject. We're not meant to understand in those first three panels I show you, a bunch of time is passing. We're meant to understand that these are different aspects of the same scene in the same moment. Now, as McLeod explains, this is really common in manga and less common in American strips, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. Take, for example, this Jim Steranko page. Here, we have some passage of time. We're sort of switching between scene to scene, action to action, and aspect to aspect transitions all at the same time. For example, the images of the lips or the phone ringing, the cigarette, and the turntable, these are meant to sort of give us a sense of space, of time, of setting the mood. The last transition McLeod talks about is a really tricky one. It's called non sequitur. And for him, this is a transition that offers no logical relationship between panels whatsoever. It's unconcerned with events of any narrative purpose of any sort. I've given some examples here. The first one is an interesting one from a strip called City of Glass. And the second two are ones that I just threw together doing random Wikipedia image searches. What I think is interesting about non sequitur is that it proves McLeod's point about closure. Because in non sequitur, there's not supposed to be any connection. And yet I find that as soon as we put images next to each other, in some sort of juxtaposed sequence, we immediately try to start making sense of them. So yeah, in that middle panel, there's no connection. I literally hit the random button and those were the pictures I got. And yet inevitably, once they're put in that context, you start trying to make up a story. We have some examples here of the ways in which, well, comic strips and transitions can be pretty complicated. On the famous page from Daredevil, which features Elektra's death, we get scene to scene, subject to subject, and even moment to moment. Likewise, in the Watchmen panel, we have a moment to moment that transitions almost seamlessly into a scene to scene as we go back into Ozymandias' flashback during the funeral of the comedian. Transitions can be affected not just by what's happening in the panels, but how the panels themselves are shaped. For example, Watchmen very famously uses a grid-like pattern, which makes the formal experimentation that Moore and Gibbons are doing all the more interesting because they're doing it in such a regular format. But in a fight scene, in an exciting horror action sci-fi adventure like Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira, those jagged lines, they affect our understanding of closure and our transitions between the panels in interesting ways as well. So just like the big triangle, these categories are fluid and fuzzy. It's less about being able to fit an example of an art form into a perfect category and being 100% right. It's more about understanding how comics work and being able to think about what a transition might be doing. I'm not gonna do a video lecture for McLeod's section on time and motion. I think he does a pretty good and clear job of explaining it. So in the next video, we're gonna return to the history of comics, back to the newspapers. See you then.